Hey everyone, welcome to Sweater Weather, a podcast about Canadian arts and culture. I'm your host, Aaron Giovanone. Today my guest is Marcello De Cintio, an author and journalist in Calgary. He's written several books of nonfiction, including Pay No Heed to the Rockets, Palestine in the Present Tense, as well as Walls, Travels Along the Barricades, which won the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for political writing, among a few other awards. Marcello has a distinguished bibliography, but most important for us today is his latest book, which has just been released. It's called Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers, published by Biblioasis Press. Driven explores the fascinating stories of the men and women who drive cab for a living. It's a terrific read, and I can't wait to talk to Marcello about it. But before we do that, I want to quickly shout out the Harbinger Media Network, of which Sweater Weather is a proud member. Check out their great lineup of shows on harbingermedianetwork.com. I also want to thank Waffle to the Left, who has recently joined Sweater Weather as an editor. Check out Waffle to the Left's excellent YouTube channel if you don't know it already. And finally, please remember to like, follow, subscribe, and review Sweater Weather wherever you see us on social media. And if you can, consider making a donation to the show to help us keep going and growing. You can find links to do that on our website, which is sweaterweatherpod.com. All right, let's talk to Marcello De Cintio, author of Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers. Thank you, Marcello, for being here. Thanks for having me. So there's lots to say about the taxi industry right now. You know, the, the big macroeconomic changes uh, wrought by apps like Uber, they are undermining a job that, you know, was always difficult, but used to be steadier, you know, more secure, paid better. We do learn about these important industry st- changes in your book, Driven, but uh, that's not the focus. So you actually do something very different in your in your book. You tell the life stories of individual cab drivers. So why do you think it's important to tell these stories right now? What do readers have to learn from the lives of taxi drivers? That's great. That's a great question. Um, and I think that you know, in my you know, my first response to that is I don't know if we if now is a particularly important time to talk to taxi drivers. You know, I think that uh, uh, what Initially, when I when I go when I got into this book, I just want I was just excited to discover the kinds of stories that we are surrounded by as Canadians, right? I could have I could have just as easily written a book about Tim Hortons baristas and gotten and gotten these amazing uh, uh, life stories. Uh, but as as you say, I think as an industry, as a business, uh, the the taxi industry is facing a kind of existential crisis. <laughs> not a not a kind of existential crisis. You know, an actual one. The a lot of the drivers I spoke to <laughs> predicted that the traditional taxi industry would be gone within five years. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't. Th- I don't think that that is going to happen. But it shows, you know, the state of peril uh, uh, that the industry is in, or at least the state of peril that these drivers believe the industry is in. And so maybe this year and a bit. I spent getting t- getting the stories of, of these cabbies was my last chance. You know, a lot of the drivers that I spoke to have stopped driving uh, 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 since the book was finished. And so that maybe was my last chance to get these stories. So I'm incredibly grateful uh, 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 that I was able to, to, to speak to these men and women while I could. Can you talk about your process for writing a book like this? You know, the, I, I imagine there's kind of a self-selection bias where, you know, the types of people who want to talk are ch- kind of chatty, uh, might be interested in having their name in print. They might get overrepresented in a book like this because they volunteer to tell you their stories. But you do seem to avoid that problem. There's a great variety of different drivers and people in this book. So like, how do you find people to interview and how do you decide whose story is going to be a good one to include? I learned pretty early on in the process that there are two kinds of taxi drivers in Canada. There are the drivers who don't want to talk and they're the drivers who don't want to stop talking. And obviously the, the it's, it's the drivers from that latter camp that, that, that fill the pages of the book. Um, so how I writ- how I initially went about trying to find drivers to talk to was that actually failed quite miserably. What I, what I, what I thought, I thought I'd be smart by going to the taxi companies themselves 
talking to the managers and the you know and the dispatcher types and and asking them if there were drivers that 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 drove for that company that might have a an interesting story to tell that might have a they might have a, a fascinating history that I, I could hear about and I really got nowhere with that approach. Uh, I was told that you know simply that drivers are too busy to talk to to a journalist and that you know that, that there's nothing in it for them. You know why 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 should they take an hour out of their incredibly busy day um, to sit with me and 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 to tell their tell their life stories? So I didn't get very far when I was going through kind of official channels uh, to talk to the drivers. The drivers I I ended up talking to I usually met through some sort of third party. You know there was I, I kind of cast the net out on on my social media looking for looking for drivers with interesting stories. And so the cabbies I talked to were were friends of friends or friends of friends of friends or 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 somebody's you know uncle or 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 these sorts of these you know these I had a way in with the drivers through a personal connection even though it was you know two or three degrees of separation away. Um, so I didn't I didn't approach them kind of you know cold as, you know coldly as a journalist. I was at least referred to uh, to them uh, by someone that they knew or someone. Uh, that knew someone that they knew. So that, that was my way in. I wanted our conversations to be much more casual than the passenger driver conversation, right? I didn't do any of my uh, interviews in the backseat of the cab. Um, first of all, that would have been incredibly expensive to, to, to give, you know, you know, hour, two hour long interviews while the meter was running. But I didn't want that, us to have that professional relationship, right? I wanted, I wanted to have more of a friendly conversation. So I met people where they felt comfortable. Uh, uh, often that was a Tim Hortons. Uh, in fact, far too often that was a Tim Hortons. Um, but I met them there. I met them in their homes and uh, just in, anywhere where they could sit for a bit and, and talk about their lives. What uh, What do you think makes a good story? Um, how did you, I mean, I'm assuming that you did lots of interviews. Maybe not every story made it in. Was there a particular quality um, or a certain, just a certain kind of story with certain elements to it that you thought would work in your book. You know, when I started out, I didn't, I didn't know what I was looking for, to be honest. Um, I just knew I was going to write about the lives of taxi drivers and I didn't know what kind of story I was looking for. Um, I mean, I'm always looking for stories I hadn't heard before. Uh, so I guess there was two kinds of stories that I knew I didn't want that I wasn't looking for. And the first was what I, what I call like a taxi noir stories, right? The kind of, the kind of uh, these sordid tales of, of, you know, sex, drugs, and misbehavior in the backseat of a cab, or the kinds of, you know, uh, shenanigans that a, a driver will witness, you know, doing, you know, driving late at night. So that Those kinds of, you know, Robert De Niro taxi driver type stories. Um, I wasn't interested in those just because we've heard them all before. They're kind of a cliche. <laughs> Which is funny because some of the drivers that I met were very surprised that I didn't want those stories. I would sit down with them and they would launch into these, these backseat stories. And uh, I, would, I, I would, you know, I would listen and, and then I would ask them about their childhoods. And it would, it's something that would, they would, they'd be taken aback because I, I didn't care so much about, um, about those, those kind of, you know, those naughty stories, uh, uh, late night stuff. So I didn't want those. And, and, and there was another kind of story that I wasn't interested in, another cliche. And it was that of the, what I call the cabby cardiologist. Uh, you know, there's this there's this uh, uh, archetype of uh, of the cab driver in Canada who was some sort of professional in in the place in the country where he was born. He was a uh, a dentist in Bangladesh or a surgeon in Iran or engineer in Pakistan. Came to Canada, found that his prof professional credentials were not recognized, and ends up by default driving a taxi. And, you know, living in big cities in, in Canada, we hear that story over and over again. And, and when I was telling people I was writing about cab drivers, they would always ask, how many doctors driving cabs have you met? I was happy that I met none. And because I didn't, I really didn't want to write that kind of story either. That, that, that's as big a cliche as the taxi after dark stories are. And besides, those stories are not, like, those stories would all be the same, right? You know, the only difference between the stories would be like, this guy was a doctor in this place, and this guy was an engineer in that place. Neither of them are doing those things, and they're driving cab. The end. Really, that, that, that's, a, that's a, not an exciting story. Um, so I was glad I didn't 
run into those cabbie cardiologists very often. Instead, the stories that I did find were utterly surprising, you know, you know multi-layered, uh, uh, fascinating stories of, 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 of trauma and war and love and escapes and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I was very happy not to, not to, uh, you know, be in the, be mired in those, in those dual cliches that I was worried about from the start. That's great. That's really good. Yeah. I've, I should have said this up front too, but, uh, like I, the book is very exciting. Um, I have to say, um, chapter by chapter it's, I mean, each chapter is different, right? But it's, um, it's like, you want to know what happens to this person and, um, you find yourself caught up in it. So however you're selecting these stories, you're doing a good job finding the ones that will be, uh, engaging and are unique, as you say. Yeah. There were stories that I didn't, you know, you know obviously I, I spoke to many more drivers and made it into the book. And yeah. so I, I, I just selected for the stories that were the most layered, that there were, that there were the most surprising. Um, I got a lot of the same types of stories. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I had, uh, let's say half a dozen stories about, about war. And so I wanted to choose the ones that were the most, the, the most exciting, the most detailed, you know, the, the, and the, and the most layered. And so, you know, I have, I have a stack of, 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 of stories that didn't make the, the final draft. Um, and I feel bad. I know I, 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 don't, I probably shouldn't, but I, you know, I, I feel bad for, for sitting with these, with these guys and, and getting them to, you know, to spill their life stories to me and then not making it into the, into the book. Um, but yeah, I, I had to be selective in a certain way. I, I, I didn't want to repeat myself. I mean, that's the research process too. I mean, how many, so how many stories are in the book? Oh, I think there's a dozen. How many people did you interview? Probably a, at least twice as many. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that, that hard work and time really does show in the book. Oh, thank I have you. To say. you know, your book il- illustrates quite viscerally that being a driver is hard. It often requires long and odd hours, poor, precarious pay, and real physical dangers. You know, as you, I hadn't really thought about this side of driving before reading your book, as you write, quote, a 2012 Stats Canada report revealed that taxi drivers are murdered on the job at a higher rate than workers of any other legal profession. So, you know, besides the fact that driving might be the only job available to to some of your interviewees, did you find there was, um, you know, a common personality type or a certain set of traits among people who drive uh, a taxi for a living? Is there like a certain kind of person attracted to it? Or maybe another way to say it, like who a kind of person who can handle it? Yeah, you know, the drivers were all very, very different, but they all possess this, this uh, 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 intense in, uh, um, independence and individuality, right? They, they, they loved the fact that they could set their own hours. They could work as hard as they wanted to work. Um, and they did, they, you know, they, they didn't really have a boss, right. You know, at least not when no one looking over them, you know, or, or, or at least every 15 minutes, they have a, a, a different boss who, whoever, whoever happens to be in the back seat. So they really only answer to themselves. And so, so, so people who had a, the great drivers are the ones who, 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 who thrive in that kind of environment. And also what they had in common too, is that, and I say this with, 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 with respect and affection, they're total know-it-alls. Right. You know, and, 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 and drivers, they love talking about all the things they know and all the things they know that you don't know. And it's not just, you know, you know, where the streets and boulevards are in whatever city they were. They know they can spot personalities, uh, at, you know, at sight. They can size up a fare while they're still a block away. You know, they, they, they can tell when someone's going to be trouble before they even get into the cab. And so they, 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 they fancy themselves these kind of amateur, uh, psychologists and <laughs> they probably are um and but what they what they do love talking about that they they love sharing their kind of secret knowledge and um i, I found that kind of really charming as as a as a know-it-all myself or i've been accused of being as being one i do appreciate <laughs> that kind of arrogance uh, uh in, in others i think you say at some point um that many of these drivers you thought were, um, I don't know if this is a direct quote, like they had a kind of a hustler type mentality. Um, did you want to exp- explain that or correct my quotation? Yeah, well, 
not hustler. I, but they're all like geniuses. They're all yeah. chess masters. You know, that's the, the other thing they all had in common. And, um, you know, if I, and this is not, this has little less to do with their life as drivers, but more to do with their, the lives that they had before they got behind the wheel is that everyone I talked to had, had somehow kind of broken every rule that they needed to break, bent the other ones. They, they, they manipulated whatever systems they were living under and, and just figured it out, you know, like figured out their life. They, they kind of, they, they, they were, they managed to, they had such practical intelligence. I know. And I think about, you know, just as, as examples, I mean, there was, there was uh, uh, Mo, who was an Iraqi soldier who was, who had beaten up a superior officer and was facing court martial, but managed to, you know, hide a way to evade prosecution by getting a desk job with the military where he would shuffle the papers around and, and reassign himself, you know, around the country to avoid being prosecuted. Or I, or I met a, um, a guy named Michael who, who lost his leg in the Sierra Leonean war. And, you know, in this, you know, and spent years in a refugee camp for amputees. And in this place that it, it was, you know, filled with desperation, you know, Michael sees the angles, right? And he, and he managed to open up a tailor shop. He managed to, to find the guy who was going to get him into Canada. He managed to start Sierra Leone's first amputee soccer team. And Michael, you know, competed with this team around the world. He did international matches and before, before making it to Canada. Like all these drivers were so smart and in, in really unique ways unique ways. And I don't mean they were smart because they're cardiologists back home. We already talked about that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, about men and women who've just managed to, you know, solve the algorithm of their lives and, 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 and be successful in whatever way success means. I was, I, I knew that I would find drivers whose work ethic I would envy. I think we can all appreciate the hours the drivers put in behind the wheel, or we can at least imagine it. We, we can also imagine the bigotry they face uh, uh, often and the violence, like you, like you mentioned. But I don't think we, we, we tend to acknowledge that the person in front of us driving, that, driving us around is so exceptionally intelligent. And, 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 and I think that was, that was the thing that they all had in common, which I was so delighted to, to discover. So every chapter of the book focuses on a different driver. Uh, you know, each is very compelling, like I mentioned before. And it's, it's but it's kind of hard not to have favorites as you're reading. You kind of <laughs> just like, you know, you really feel yourself charmed by one or another in particular. So I was hoping that you'd indulge me by talking in detail about a couple of specific drivers. So you already mentioned Mo, which is one of my favorites. I'm assuming that many readers find Mo pretty interesting. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about Mo. You mentioned him already. He's an I Iraqi Canadian who drives cab, uh, or used to, in used Halifax. To. Yeah. And his his chapter is called "The Bully of Baghdad." So let's talk a bit more about Mo. It's funny. Mo Mo is my favorite driver in the book, uh, uh, and Mo is one of the most favorite, my, one of the most amazing and, and uh, uh, interesting people I've ever met. Um, and it's interesting that you say that a lot of people would find Mo their favorite because I've had readers. Uh, who ad, who utterly despised Mo, uh, you know, as a as a character, and I kind of can see that because Mo has always been, you know, kind of a dick. You know, Mo Mo, uh, 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 he was always like the biggest kid in in school, and and, and end up being the you know the, always the biggest guy in the room. Um, he was a total bully at, at, for his entire life. Um, Mo, you know, he was a wrestling champion, which endeared him to me as, as a. As, as, as a you know, former wrestler myself, he um, he fought two wars for Saddam Hussein, uh, one against the Iranians and one against the Americans. Um, suffered in, in intense suffers from intense PTSD. He's a guy who's got a tendency towards violence. I've already mentioned that he he you know he he had assaulted a, a superior officer. He ended up evading prosecution for a while, but ended up uh, doing time in, in an Iraqi military prison. But he also wanted to be an artist. You know, he's, he's got, the, you know, this, this sensitive artistic side. He went, you know, and he, when he first came to Halifax, uh, he wanted, he was in art school. And, uh, you know, just the, the guy is such, it's just filled with contradictions, this guy. 
Yeah, he, he, he was. He, he kind of he did not like. He did not enjoy art school. He did not fit in with the with the with the art school type, which does not surprise me. <laughs> Same, yeah. Yeah. That, I, let me just say that 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 section is very like I understood that like <laughs> um, going to. I mean, here is a a grown man um, who has seen a lot of shit. <laughs> he's yeah. now he's now in a class with like a bunch of arts, like, you know, fine arts undergrads and having been essentially one of those myself, like, I'm like Oh my God. I talked to one There's of his, like, yeah, I talked to one of his former professors and she said, yeah, like, like he was, he totally stood out. And she goes, she says he, she doesn't blame him for, you know, d- despising the, the, these, these sheltered, uh, 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 art, art school kids that were surrounding him because he had been through so much and they'd been through nothing. But, you know, he had a legit art like career, right? Cause isn't there a stage in his life before he comes to Canada? Yeah. He leaves Iraq and he's, is he in Jordan? If I remember correctly. That's right. He's and, in, he, he spends some time in Jordan and uh, it's funny cause he starts off in like on a construction site and here's this big bruising guy who can't, you can't cut it doing construction. Like they you know his, his hands are too soft for construction ends up getting jobs doing um like graphic design and illustration and and, and having a, a reasonable career in it uh in in Jordan before before uh making the move with his then wife uh to Halifax yeah yeah and he was making a living as a like as an illustrator of different yes. different sorts yeah, so yeah. talk about, I mean I can't you know talk about um being flexible just kind of working with what you know uh, adapting to what's what's available to you at the time. Yeah, um, the thing with him where, too that I find really interesting about about Mo is that you know you know he, you know he is the bully of Baghdad. He is an arrogant guy, and and, th- and these are words he would use to describe himself. He calls himself a peacock. He calls himself vain, and um, and he has this this he calls it his tick towards violence. And he's been twice been arrested uh, uh, for assault in 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 Halifax. Um, and narrowly avoided, you know, doing doing time here in, in Canada. Um, but I've never met anyone who's so self-aware of their own failings. You know, he wasn't ashamed to talk about uh, uh, his arrogance and his and his violence um, and his PTSD that he's medicated for. Uh, 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 it's funny. He's vain, but not too vain to talk about his own vanity, it, which, you know, which is fascinating. I've never met anyone as self-aware as Mo. Uh, and I am sh- I am certainly not as self aware as Mo. Um, so here's here's this rough and bruising guy who might be the most complicated uh, uh, person that I've I've ever talked to. A part of his story I also found fascinating is his stint um, driving the like kind of the rich yeah. and famous of Halifax, and how you tell the story of how he kind of got in on that angle of being a driver. And Halifax, do you want that? I found very interesting. Um, his proximity to the very wealthy and powerful. Yeah. yeah, here's this guy. Like he was, he was driving a regular cab, and he and he and he hated it. And uh, he started driving around. You know how he describes. It. I started dri- driving around the million dollar, the, the driving around the millionaires, and then I started. They introduced me to the multi millionaires. So he became this kind of preferred driver for Halifax's elite. But then he became more than just their driver. He was like this concierge, and, and he would he would pick up he would pick up uh, 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 cases of wine for them when they had parties. He would have the key codes for their mansions. You know, he, they would they would trust Mo with with this information. And he was also acted as their babysitter sometimes, where the, he he talked about these very wealthy uh, uh, Haligonians. Who would who would go out and, and drink to excess and make complete asses out of themselves, and Mo was there kind of to to clean up their mess, you know, to, you know, to, to take them home when they couldn't get home to keep them from getting into trouble. Um, yeah, he was he was almost like this. Yeah, I called him. I said he was like a babysitter or a chaperone for for the moneyed people of Halifax, um, which is far different than than you know, the regular cabs who are shuttling, you know, he would say like old ladies to and from the supermarket. No, he was, he, he was, sometimes he would carry the, 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 the drunk wives of his clients into their apartments after a particularly rough night out. You know, he was trusted, he was trusted by these, by these people. It's, it's so remarkable. It's a remarkable story. Maybe another of my favorites is, um, it's, uh, Alex, uh, Saliga or Saliga. How do you pronounce that, Marcello? I think it's, I think it's Saliga. 
Saliga. So yeah, Alex Saliga, mm-hmm. he's a slow uh, Slovakian immigrant in his, I guess he's in his seventies now. Yeah. But he, he drove a cab in Edmonton yes. and his chapter is titled the charmed life of Alex uh, Saliga or sorry, I got it wrong again, probably, but he, that is a very charming chapter. I have to say this guy is, uh, seems like a very unique and interesting fellow. Can you tell us about, about him? Yeah. Alex, Alex is one of those guys who I mentioned off the top who does not stop talking. Right. And, and, and you gotta, you love Alex for it. Alex is in his seventies. He looks like he's in his fifties. Uh, uh, he's this guy's in a remarkable shape. He has this um, remarkable story of, you know, escaping Czechoslovakia during, during the, the, from behind the iron curtain in, in the eighties, him and his wife and his daughter, Eva. And they, they, they piled into their battered Skoda. They had forged documents and somehow, I mean, the, the whole, the whole escape plan was so poorly thought out and yet somehow they managed. And this is why I call it the chapter, like his charmed life. Cause they somehow use these forged documents to get most of the way across Europe. They end up in prison and you know, at a border post for a little while, the whole family end up in a refugee camp. And then gets and then get to uh, eventually make it the way to Edmonton of all places. And Alex, <laughs> Alex had you know he's always he's, he's he's a schemer, right? I talked about these guys with their practical intelligence, right? And, and but Alex's scheme, I call it his get rich slow scheme, was for him. He thought the key to his fortune would be if he trained his daughter to become a tennis champion, and that way she would earn big money, you know, big winnings. And that, you know, that, that would be, you know, that, that, that they would, that would be the fortune that the family would have. Now, <laughs> training at like in Edmonton, Alberta, you know, train your daughter to be a, a tennis champion. It's probably not the, not the smartest or the easiest way to fame and fortune, you know, but this was and also the fact that Alex did not play tennis or had ever played tennis and nor did Eva, nor did she want to. She wanted to play with her dolls and, 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 and her dad, you know, forces her onto the court and trains her to be in to be a tennis champ. And she did very, very well, except his, Alex's like brutal and, and often cruel coaching with her eventually not only turned her off from the sport, but turned her off from him altogether. And they were estranged for decades uh, 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 before relatively recently, you know, get, getting together again. So I talked to both Alex and Eva and um, what, a ch- what, a, what a charm, two utterly charming people. Uh, um, who now have this father-daughter relationship again that they hadn't had for for many, many years before. He took the tennis very seriously. Yeah. And you, that chapter goes into quite a bit of detail about their regi- their training regime and um, their kind of their, their place at the, uh, I forget the name of the club, the tennis club in Edmonton. Oh, um, Glenora? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So, uh, and so they become these kind of well-known personalities, especially Alex becomes a well-known personality there, there in the club. Um, it seems to me that, um, he's such an interesting character too, because he saw, it does seem like a little, a little, um, little strange to think tennis is your, your route to upward mobility. But of course there is like a long tradition of, of working class, poor people who make it through sport. Right. And, um, and so that was Alex's idea. It just happened to be tennis and not a very well-known tennis nation. Um, but, um, he, he got, he did get pretty far. I mean, like his daughter was, was nationally ranked. Was she not? She was, she got, she got a sponsorship deal briefly too. She just was, but the, the, you know, the pressure from her father made, she, she ended up hating tennis. You know, they were, you know, in, in a way he, he trained her to be great and he also trained her to hate it. You know, and so she she couldn't wait to quit when she was a teenager, and and she she explained the uh, uh, like his scheme this way. She said that they came from, you know, uh, uh, Soviet Czechoslovakia, where where uh, you know maybe maybe in Canada, if you wanted your your kid to be uh, 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 wealthy, you you would put her you would pay for her med school or law school, right? But in, but in but in Czechoslovakia. Um, you know, under that under the socialist system, the doctors didn't make any more than the than than the machinists did, which is what uh, Alex uh, worked as. But the athletes did, you know. So so if you were a star athlete uh, behind the Iron Curtain, you know, during the Cold War, you were you were wealthy. So it it made it made sense from his background, right? Um, maybe not so much. Yeah, you know, 
like you say, this is not exactly a tennis loving nation. You know, that's, that, that's not, that's not a key to, 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 to fame and fortune in Canada. Um, she, he would have been much better off, you know, putting her through med school or, or law school or, or, or something else. Um, but, uh, uh, that was, that kind of reflected on, on, on who he was and where he was from. And, um, in the end, he became yeah. the tennis champion. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, he was training his, his poor daughter like tw twice a day uh, before and after school in tennis. And then all summer he would take her, take her to camps and, and it, like he would, it, it was, it was, he was serious and he would study uh, coaching videos. And, and, and so he was learning the game and he would be her training partner. So eventually he got to be quite a good player himself and, and still plays long after Eva you know, quit tennis. You know, uh, Alex continued and he ended up winning medals at like these these masters tournaments uh, uh, for, for, you know, for the 60 plus uh, athlete set. Right. Like at an international level, international right? level. Absolutely. Yes. He, he, he competed internationally and, and brought home medals, but he doesn't play much anymore because of kind of the what happened at the end of the story where uh, this is just a few years ago. Alex was driving uh, someone around in, in his cab. The guy didn't have any money. Alex was going to drive him somewhere to get some money. And uh, the guy jumps from the back seat with a hunting knife and tries to kill Alex. You know, stabs at his throat with his hunting knife. Alex manages to to dodge that the initial uh, stab. He, 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 he doesn't get in, catch his throat. He kind of catches him under the chin. Um, and this, and this fight ensues between him and this guy and the, this, this, this assailant with a knife. <laughs> but the story is that this guy picked the wrong cab driver to attack because not only was Alex like, it's like this tennis champ, he was also trained in this obscure style of karate. where He had learned how to disarm someone. And so, so, this guy's jumping, you know, what is going to fight this elderly cabbie who turns out to be this badass. Alex kicks this guy's ass <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, not, you know, saves his own life and, and beats this guy up uh, uh, before being before the kind of the crowd, people crowd around the car and, and, and tear them up and, and bring them apart. Um, but but he very well could have died in that attack. Um, we talked earlier about 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 uh, how many cabbies are, are murdered on the job. Alex could easily have been another one. Um, and it was partly due to his, his near death experience there uh, where him and Eva reconciled after that. It was, you know, she had realized that she almost lost her dad and it was, it was, it was time for them to, you know, to, to, to get back together again and, and, and to reconcile. And they've been, they've been tight ever since. Amazing. Uh, when that happens. In, in that story. And also one other detail about Alex that um, I found fascinating was uh, sort of like Mo, um, there's a sort of uh, his life. Uh, I mean, I guess he's a tough guy like Mo. That's a big, that's a commonality between these two, these two people. But also he, he finds himself um, kind of through tennis in that tennis club brought into the social sphere of, of the wealthy. Yeah. And that's something that he uh, he values. Do you do you want to say something about his um, kind of sense of his own place? Uh, so, uh, you know, his own class, I guess. Yeah. No, he, you know, part of why he wanted to to make Eva famous is because he wanted to be wealthy and he wanted to he wanted to rub elbows with 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 the elite. Right. You know, he was a he was a machinist, a machinist and then started driving taxi. And, and but he wanted to be part of the of, of of this elite, and these are the people that he met at the Glenora Club. You know, there's not there's no other cab drivers with 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 tennis memberships at the at the Glenora. Everyone loved him there. Like he would he would have a, a, a former you know uh, he had the liberal Alberta's Liberal Party leaders as his doubles partner at one point, or Dr. Raj Sherman, um, who whose politics Alex despises, uh, but but they were good enough tennis partners uh, to carry on. So he's kind of rubbing elbows with this elite, these people who 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 love him for his charm and his sense of humor and and, and his and his you know his his good his good nature. Um and Alex realized in his time with these with these wealthy Edmontonians that he was happier than they were. That for for all the wealth that they had and for for the private jets that they would fly and and, and the, the vacations that they went on, um 
Alex didn't feel like they had anything that he didn't have. And it, it, it was it was kind of being in that in that kind of exalted space that Alex was became for the first time in his life quite happy with uh, with where he was, you know, on the on the social ladder. Um, he didn't need to be uh, a millionaire. You know, he, he, he didn't need he didn't need that level of wealth to be happy. And everyone who meets him says that, you know, he's, he's the happiest guy they meet, you know, and and and. Uh, and when you, if you've ever, if you ever meet him, he's, 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 he's energetic and he's bubbly and he's talkative and he, and, and he's, 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 in, he's, in, he's fit. Like, you know, he's the kind of guy you'd envy, uh, uh, regardless of what he does for a living. Alex wasn't really that wrong, uh, in the end about, uh, up, you know, upward mobility, uh, through, uh, sport because it's his, uh, admired status as like a tennis champion at the club, but that I'm sure caught, you know, caught the eye of many many of the wealthy the wealthy patrons there and uh in, you know and um gave him access to these these social circles too yeah what, what he was wrong about is that it took wealth you know what i mean it, 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 he didn't he didn't have to be he didn't have to be rich to be as happy as the rich guys you know like it, it, it was it was about kind of enjoying life you know that, that here, here's a guy who, who here's a guy who loves life Seems like a happy guy. And it was also maybe worth pointing out that because of his age, he was driving cab mostly at an earlier, in an earlier period, right? When the industry was, was paid better, was more, was more secure. So he doesn't seem to be, you know, economically, you know, in trouble right now. No. Whereas uh, going back to Mo, uh, it seems like he's kind of in, he's a younger guy, right? So he has to keep working and um, he's not sure what he's going to do right now. You have uh, an excellent, uh, I guess a kind of postscript in your book talking about the effects of uh, the, the pandemic on the taxi industry. And you return to talk to some of your, mm -hmm. some of your interviewees. And Mo is one of those guys. Uh, where's what's Mo up to now? Mo's not in a great place. You know, Mo, uh, uh, those, those wealthy patrons that he, that he was driving around and, and ba babysitting, you know, when, when, when everyone's, you know, under lockdown and quarantined, you know, they didn't, they didn't need, they didn't need him anymore. Um, he had to sell his, his beloved BMW. Um, and, uh, and he's kind of looking for the next thing. You know, uh, when I, when I, when I talked to him for that pandemic postscript uh, in the book, he had started, um, he had quit driving altogether and he had started, he wanted to start a business making like uh, Arabic style, Iraqi style sausages and kind of food food products uh, uh, that, that he know he has all these re great recipes for. He wanted to do that, well, and of course he did. You know, you know Mo's gonna Mo's gonna do everything. But I I did talk to him again just a few days ago, and uh, uh, that didn't that didn't end up coming together. His 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 food business didn't end up coming together, and he's he's looking to start trying art again. Uh, which I was kind of surprised, and I was both surprised and quite uh, warmed to hear that 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 Mo was gonna was was gonna give art another shot because uh, 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 he felt very disillusioned by his time, uh, like we mentioned, you know, in, in art school in Halifax, and and I, and I and I love that he's gonna he's gonna give it another go. Oh, I'm happy to hear that too. So you know, there has been at different times. Uh, a cultural fascination with taxi drivers. You know, in the book you mentioned, and you mentioned in our interview, uh, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. You know, the sitcom Taxi. You know, with Danny DeVito and Judd Hirsch. Anyone who hasn't seen those old episodes, they're pretty. It's a good show. It's a good show. Uh, yeah, and um, there's a kind of a less known novel. It's called Taxi by Helen Potrebenko, who was a female cab driver in Vancouver in the '70s. And you know, it seems to me that maybe the 70s was a high point for cultural interest in taxi drivers. Um, and it's probably safe to say that this job doesn't have the same visibility in arts and culture as it once did. I don't know if that seems right to you or not. You know, your book is obviously going against this trend. But do you have a sense of maybe why the cab driver would find less cultural representation now than, than it once did? Well, look at the people you mentioned. Helen Potrebenko, uh, Robert De Niro, and and the cast of Taxi were all white. They, they, they represent a time when the industry they, they represent a time right before the industry uh, started becoming an industry for for immigrant workers, which it is now. Right? I mean, uh, the the something or immigrants of color. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. You know, before the, before the seventies and early eighties, uh, um, the taxi industry looked a lot different than it does now. Uh, 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 it, it was, it was, it was, it was white men and women driving cabs. And now it mostly isn't as, as we know. And I think that might have something to do with it. I mean, even, even the, the show taxi, the, the only the only immigrant in that whole show was also white, and he wasn't even you know it was, it was Andy Kaufman's Latka, and he and he and he was also a white guy. Uh, yeah, he play he plays. Uh, what is he? Yeah, what is his character? I can't remember. Like he's some. Maybe, he's weird. Like his, weird, his character is that he's a weird guy from some yeah. fictional Eastern European kind. Of oh, thing like that. okay, it's fiction. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, I believe so. I don't. I don't. I don't think he came from any real place. That ac- that accent was not uh, familiar to, to anyone. Um, so yeah, I think, I think what changed after that is the, the taxi industry really became a job for it. It's, it's an, it's an immigrant job. It's a kind of job that immigrants do. And let's, let's face it that those kinds of jobs are not held in, in, in typically in, in, in high regard in Canada. Right. Um, you know, I, I write about, I write a chapter about Rawi Hodge, uh, 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 who, you know, drove cab in Montreal and did, you know, did a lot of, you know, immigrant jobs. He worked in a factory in New York. He drove cab in Montreal. And when- and Rawi Haj is, a, just for the audience who may not know, he's a celebrated Canadian author right, now. Right. Uh, winner, winner of the, like, maybe one of the world's biggest literary prizes, the Impact Dublin Literary Award. Yeah, it was, it was uh, the biggest at the written- time, at least. It might still be. But yeah, yeah. Right, but he was driving, he wrote that, he wrote his, his Impact Dublin uh, award-winning novel called De Niro's Game, interesting enough, um, while he was driving cab in Montreal. And when uh, when that book hit, you know, when it became when it became a, such a success, journalists would would describe Rowie as the immigrant who made it, which is is, is a problematic. Uh, I think it's problematic praise because it's the idea that you make it. An immigrant who makes it is an immigrant who stops doing jobs that immigrants do, right? If you become a novelist, you've made it. But I look at some of the other drivers in the book who are still driving, who have who have supported their families, who put their kids through school, who who um who survived and you know wars and escaped you know terrible uh, trauma and deprivation. You know, haven't they made it? You know, you know, did, we don't we don't we don't say that they've made it because they're still driving cab. Um, so I think I, I think I've drifted away from your original question, but there is I think there is a sense that I think part of the reason why the the cab driver is not such a common character, a, a celebrated character in 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 contemporary culture, is because it's a, it's a job that 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 the society at large diminishes that 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 feels is 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 a uh, is not to be celebrated. I've had I had one cabbie tell me that often the his passengers treat him as if he's a part of the car, right? You know this idea that these are the these are the invisible uh, uh, men and women that drive us around, and and they don't get a lot of a lot of respect. And you look what's happened now with with the, with the with the rideshare apps. Uh, although if I said rideshare to any of these guys, they would lose it because they know that <laughs> he's shared they're being paid. But these 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 ride for hire apps. Um, those, you know, so many uh, uh, citizens of the of, of 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 Calgary and everywhere else who who love Uber will will you know you know talk about Uber, uh, um, you know, they 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 don't consider Uber a problem because to hell with the cab drivers. If, if if that industry can't survive, then it can't survive. Um, th- there's no we don't value those men and women behind the wheel in the same way that we that, that maybe we used to. I don't know if it's romantic anymore. You know, I don't. You know, I, I think you know. It's, it's it's there's something about that too. Yeah, I mean, those like say certainly taxi driver. There's a whole romantic element to uh, to that character, uh, lo- kind of lone wolf uh, out there at night. Um, you know, he's you know famously psychologically disturbed, but he's kind of oddly redeemed through you know what happens in that. I think there's something about the '70s too. Like, yeah, certainly you mentioned that these are just jobs that are not valued in our in our society, and so. That's reflected in, you know, their working conditions as well as their kind of cultural uh, visibility or invisibility. Mm-hmm. But, there, you know, when you look at the 70s, too, yeah, there was a lot there was a big difference in, you know, who drivers were like racially. Yeah. 
And also, I think like the seventies, there was a tendency to to uh, portray working the working class a little yes. bit more. I think the culture of that era and a little bit earlier um, had um, had sort of a larger role for like working class uh, people and characters. And in the seventies, a lot of that changes, and I think that's partly just because of the economic and the really kind of the large historical forces that are changing our economy. And one of the things they're doing is is uh, increasingly devaluing working class jobs. So attacking unions, yeah. uh, just kind of rhetorically, you know, saying, you know, working class people get paid too much. That's why we have the economic problems that they had in the 70s, like inflation, for example. So there's a whole cultural shift, I think, that begins in the 70s uh, around the working class that uh, I think it leads us to a place where, yeah, working class characters like cab drivers also um, get, you know, kind of, we lose sight of them, uh, in, in, in the cultural realm a little bit more. It's funny, it's funny so, you, br you bring that up because, uh, um, you know, early on, you know, the, the, the manuscript I delivered to my editor was not the manuscript that he thought he was going to get. And I think what, what you're talking about here about the, the socioeconomic state of the industry, uh, how it's changed, where it's at now, all of, all of, the, all of those things, all, all the business side of it, um, was something that I was far less interested in than the lives of the drivers themselves, right? which I think is, is quite clear in, in, in our interview and in the book. You know, I'm, it's, it's their life stories that I'm fascinated with. I was far less interested in taxi driving than I was with taxi drivers. Um, um, but I think, you know, it, when, when, I, when I delivered my, 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 kind of my first draft to, to the, my editor, he was he was surprised that 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 there, there wasn't the stuff that you're talking about now the the that that it was it was it wasn't there at least not not as much as he as he thought it would be um so that you know maybe, maybe that's, a, that's an entirely different book uh, that that someone much smarter than me could write about uh, about about all, about all of that um but yeah i i, I it's funny you, you mentioned that because that that that's something that i didn't avoid but something that i didn't focus on when i when i when i was writing the book it's not my oh, area of expertise. Well, I mean, I'm so glad you wrote the book you did. I mean, that other stuff, you know, where did I learn that? In, in other books. Yeah, <laughs> so, sure, you, know, sure. I, you didn't need to write that that book. The book you wrote is beautiful. Uh, it's called uh, it's called Driven, this, the, the Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers. Is that right? The, the subtitle? Yes. It's a beautiful book. I highly recommend uh, that you read it. And uh, thank you again, Marcello, for talking to me today. Oh, thanks so much, Aaron. This was great.